For us in the Northern Hemisphere, the summer is pretty much reaching its end. And as a parent, I'm pretty happy about that because it means my daughter is back in school. Before we start talking about pumpkin spice everything and the holiday season, here's one last hurrah. And for many like me, no summer is complete without having ridden the topic of today's episode at least once. Although you might be surprised to learn its origins actually began as a winter recreational activity. I'm your host, Emily Prokop, and this is the story behind roller coasters. But first, a quick message. It's less than two months until the story behind book releases, and I am so super excited about it. And it doesn't even seem real yet. If you haven't pre-ordered your copy, you can find the book on Amazon.com and BarnesandNoble.com. But believe it or not, there are lots of books with the story behind in the title. So people have said searching the story behind with my name works better if you're searching. Or the super easy way to go is go to thestorybehindbook.com and click the links over there. By the way, the more people who order the book, the more the price will go down. So if you see that price tag and it's a little off-putting, don't worry, the price will probably go down. Oh, and one more thing I was told by my publisher to let people know. If you are an Amazon Associates member, you can make an affiliate link to the book on Amazon and share the link with your audience or on your blog or website and receive a little kickback when people purchase it. Anyway, thank you to everyone who has been promoting the book so far. You're all amazing, and it means the world to me that fellow podcasters and listeners have been some of the biggest supporters. So, thank you. This episode will be filled with some ups and downs. I mean, let's just get the puns out of the way, right? You probably think of roller coasters as being a fairly recent invention, considering all the safety measures that are taken with them. But believe it or not, they are close to 600 years old. They can be traced back to Russia during the Middle Ages, when giant wooden slides that were as tall as 70 feet high were frozen, and riders would slide down on blocks of ice. As centuries went on, the trend had spread to Europe. In the 18th century, Catherine the Great was such a fan, she wanted a version for summer, so she had wheels put on carts and added grooves to the tracks. In 1817, cars that were locked onto tracks were introduced in Paris, as well as a pulley system that would bring carts back to the peak. Paris also boasts the first time a successful loop was created for the roller coaster, which was tested using sandbags, monkeys, and one brave worker. By the way, these were known at the time as Russian ice slides, and now many Americans refer to coasters as Russian mountains, although now Russians refer to them as American mountains. That's because when roller coasters finally came to America in 1884, the first was designed and built by Lamarcus Thompson, a garment maker and Sunday school teacher who was known to be concerned with the number of brothels and saloons he saw while traveling. And he wanted to create a wholesome family amusement. He is now known as the father of the roller coaster because of how popular his was, which was the Gravity Switchback Railway at Coney Island in Brooklyn, New York. The early 1900s through the 1920s are considered the golden age of roller coasters. Once people saw the popularity of the Gravity Switchback Railway, it wasn't long before more coasters began springing up over the country. Theme park owners and coaster designers worked hard to top others with more speed, sharper turns, and higher dips. If you ever wanted to talk yourself out of going to an amusement park, there are plenty of listicles I came across in my research about coasters that are no longer running because of fatalities and injuries. But many of them were closed when the depression hit and owners couldn't afford the upkeep. The coasters were dismantled for parts, and some parks were torn down to make room for more houses and apartments once World War II ended and the baby boom brought more families to the suburbs. It seemed roller coasters were slowly becoming a thing of the past until 1959, when an animator-turned-amusement park owner was visiting Switzerland and was inspired by the mountains. According to legend, he found a postcard of the Matterhorn and mailed it to his crew back home with the words, Build this, scrawled on the back. The vacationer was none other than Walt Disney, who was expanding his four-year-old amusement park in Anaheim, California, and wanted to create a roller coaster that ran through Swiss-inspired mountains. It was the first coaster to run on tubular steel tracks instead of wood, and the Imagineers discovered the steel tracks could be more easily bent, providing passengers with a smoother ride. Disneyland became the moment coasters came back into the public eye, and steel coasters began surpassing wooden coasters. 
but wooden coasters still hold a nostalgic place for many theme park goers. Some people are so in love with the thrill, they consider themselves roller coaster enthusiasts and travel to different parks all over the world. The American Coaster Enthusiasts is one such group that's been around since 1978 and have organized tours and special events, sometimes even partnering with parks to gain access to coasters before the regular patrons. But many people won't go near them, either out of fear or just not liking the physical tolls roller coasters put on the body. I mentioned before about coming across a few articles talking about the injuries and fatalities that have occurred on roller coasters. Many of these were because the riders weren't taking proper precautions, including a roller coaster company worker who stood up to deliver a speech to riders about safety and fell to his death. Now, according to statistics, roller coasters are incredibly safe and parks are held to very strict safety guidelines when it comes to these rides. But there's still a thrill that comes with riding a roller coaster, getting to the top of that first hill and descending. The first drop is actually how the coasters are able to create enough energy to continue its path along the rest of the track. The more I read about the energy needed to propel a roller coaster forward, the more I wished I had a physics teacher who took us to an amusement park to learn about kinetic energy, which is the energy of things moving, and centripetal force, which is what keeps us in our seats during loops. But aside from physics, roller coasters also hold some secrets to the study of psychology, specifically why humans seek the thrill. Initially, it may seem like the speed is the main reason people are drawn to these fast rides, but more likely, the reason many love the sensation of riding a roller coaster is the same reason people see horror movies. In fact, many of the physiological reactions are the same, an increase in heart rate, faster breathing, and a feeling of exhilaration and the boost of adrenaline. Riding a roller coaster has been shown to raise the levels of endorphins too, which are those feel-good hormones. But they can also produce cortisol, which is the stress hormone. Roller coaster riders are known to have an experience known as eustressful, which is actually known as a good kind of stress. Information for this episode was sourced from Scientific American, Popular Mechanics, History.com, and more links which can be found in the show notes at thestorybehindpodcast.com. Since I missed the last few weeks of episodes, there are tons of Trivia Tuesday posts to catch up on from the Story Behind discussion group on Facebook. And I want to thank everyone who joins the group and posts there. By the way, you can post these trivia bits anytime during the week, not just Tuesday. Barry posted that there's a Yogi Bear graveyard of sorts in North Carolina with old statues of characters from Yogi Bear from the 60s and 70s when there was a chain of restaurants called Yogi Bear Honey Fried Chicken. That has since been closed. Adam posted Richard Branson once offered William Shatner a spot on the first Virgin Galactic flight to space. Shatner turned it down, saying he's actually afraid of space travel. He is also afraid of getting sick and possibly dying. Beckett posted cockamamies were the first temporary tattoos. You'd get them out of comic books. Jen posted Jacob Grimm, who is known as one of the Grimm brothers and collectors of fairy tales, was also a highly regarded linguist and figured out how a lot of sounds shifted in Germanic languages, like a P to an F. Ryan posted he hasn't been able to confirm if this is actually true, but while researching the origin of the Baby Shark song, he found the word for evil in German is Boazer, and it made him think that Bowser from Super Mario Brothers derives his name from it, but he hasn't been able to locate any notes regarding Bowser's English naming. Glenn posted, because we are coming into the burrs in a few days, as in September, October, November, we will be inundated with pumpkin spice. But did you know that nutmeg and mace, the spice, not the weapon, both came from the same plant? The tropical nutmeg plant has been used since 540 AD. Nutmeg spice comes from the ground kernel, while mace comes from the outer covering of the nut, called the aril, which surrounds the seed. By the way, as a former crossword puzzle editor, that term aril is a good word to know. It's used a lot. Brett posted, if you ever wondered why there's often a second capital letter in surnames, starting with Mac or Mick, that is because Mac and Mick are prefixes that mean son of. Early inconsistencies in records are what led to having both MC and MAC prefixes. Mick is just an abbreviation of Mac, and both can actually be abbreviated further to the much less common M apostrophe. And Brett posted further about the origins of Mick and Mac as last name prefixes. 
which I encourage you to come check out in the Facebook group. Mark posted he learned that the offspring of a male donkey called a jack and a female horse, a mare, is a mule. However, if it's a female donkey called a jenny and a male horse, a stallion, the offspring is a hinny. Adam posted, apparently at one point, the group known as the Pirate Bay tried to buy their own island so they could create a country with no copyright laws. And Mark posted that he learned because of her star status over her other co-stars, Whoopi Goldberg would have gotten top billing for her role as Guinan in the film Star Trek Generations, but she didn't want to bump her friend Patrick Stewart from the top spot in his first feature film, so she asked her agent to make sure her name was not used in promoting the film. Jeffrey posted, based on the official counts of the respective organizations, the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame has the same number of inductees as the Baseball Hall of Fame, 323. And Luke posted, apparently grass grows the most at dawn. But he heard that on a radio ad, so he said he's skeptical of the legitimacy of that. If you'd like to talk trivia you pick up during the week and have it read on the show, join the Story Behind Discussion Group on Facebook. This episode was brought to you by the Story Behind executive producers who support the show through the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the story behind and who also get early access to the full script before the episode goes live. So a big thank you to newest Patreon supporters, Jonathan Bloom and Ryan P. Jackson and ongoing executive producers, Barry G, Andrew Scott, Jared Dunham, Linguist Sam, Epic Film Guy Nick, Ryle Davis Jr., Dave Jackson, Sunshine and Power Cuts, Everyone Has a Podcast, Adam Higgins, The Beardcaster, Aliquity from Travel Gluten Free, Jim Collison, North Omaha History Podcast, Dan Brennick, Two Peas on the Podcast, Jason Bryant, History Goes Bump, The One Word Go Show, and Stargate Pioneer. Thanks for listening.